Good evening. You're listening to the True Crime Witch Podcast. I'm your host, Emma, and I will be taking you into the world of everything murderous, mysterious, and downright macabre. Before we jump into this week's episode, first of all, happy halloween This episode will be going live on Halloween, even though I'm recording it before then, but happy Halloween, the spookiest day of the year, and we're all trapped inside. <laughs> typical, typical 2020. I have uh, a few reviews to read out, so I've got one from my lovely friend Tyler. Um, He gave me a five-star review, really glowing review, so thank you. I have another one from Eric Carter-Landon, who also gave me a five-star review. Thank you so much, Eric. I love your podcast. Um, I have one from Podcast163, and I don't know who you are, but thank you. You gave me a really nice review. Now, I do have two other reviews to mention, but these are both one-stars. So one of them is from Enat Bird, and he said, More woke crap. Shame. Liked it until the same old. Black Lives Matter rubbish and anti-white agenda. Yawn. Zero stars. Thanks. And then another person, Sate Tan, said, Wrong information. If you like the bare minimum of a case, sure. What I don't like is the use of incorrect information. Without any further ado, let's get into the episode, shall we? If you're anything like me, then Halloween is your favourite time of year. Snuggling into the sofa to watch Halloween horror movies, sweets filling the shelves in the supermarkets, along with Halloween decorations that you definitely use as normal decorations all year round. Halloween is super special when you're a kid. It's the one night of the year where you're encouraged to knock on strangers' doors and get sweets from them, something that would otherwise be heavily discouraged. It's special because you get to go to school dressed up and play games all day and have fun. It's virtually the one night of the year where it is acceptable to shove as much chocolate and sweets into your face as humanly possible and, you know, make yourself sick the next day. On October 31st, 1974, the O'Brien family and the Bates family had a fun night planned for their children. First, they shared dinner together before planning to take their children out trick or treating. Running up to different houses, the children patiently waited until the residents opened the doors before shouting, Trick or treat! Residents would respond with, Oh wow, you're so scary! before, you know, chuckling and giving them candy and sweets. Content, the children would simply skip to the next house to get more. O'Brien and Bates said that they had both waited on the paths whilst their children knocked on doors and collected candy. This was 1974 in Deer Park, Texas, and things are not like they are today. Even in the early 2000s, I was allowed to go out trick-or-treating around my like little estate while our parents waited. It wasn't something that was that unusual. All was going well until they reached the home of the Melvin family. The lights were on, but of course, no one was home. Still, little Timothy and the other children waited at the door. When no one responded, they simply ran to the next house. The front door of the Melvin house had a wall that concealed the front of the door, and whilst the children ran off to the next house, Ronald O'Brien stood and got five pixie sticks out of his pocket. He got up to the children and explained that the Melvins had answered the door, after all, and had given the sweets to them. He handed the pixie sticks over to the children, and that included giving one to his son, Timothy. Now, Ronald O'Brien had a son, Timothy, and a daughter, Elizabeth, and I'm not sure about the Bates children, but Timothy is the main person in our story today. As it was October, it of course started to rain, and kids, you know, weren't bothered about the rubbish weather, but the parents definitely were. They decided to cut trick-or-treating short, much to Timothy and the other children's dismay. But Ronald promised Timothy that if they headed back home early, he would let him have one piece of candy before he had to go to bed. Satisfied that this was a good deal, Timothy agreed, followed by Elizabeth and his dad and the other children returned to their respective homes. Now, Timothy's mother was out visiting a friend, so him and his dad, Ronald, 
along with his sister Elizabeth, sat in the living room combing through the mountain of sweets that they picked up that evening. One piece of candy caught Timothy's eye. It was the pixie stick that was from the Melvins' house. According to Ronald, that was anyway. Timothy was spurred on by his dad to eat the pixie stick instead of anything else from the mountain of sweets that lay before him. He was very insistent that Timothy ate the pixie stick. For those who aren't familiar, pixie sticks are those like long paper, sometimes plastic tubes filled with sugar or some kind of sherbet. To an eight-year-old as Timothy was, they are heaven. <laughs> What's better than being able to, you know, sh funnel sugar directly down your throat? The answer is nothing. Timothy ripped open the pixie stick, but to his frustration, he was having a hard time getting the contents out. Ronald picked it up, rolled it in his hands to loosen the sugar inside, and handed it back to Timothy. Now, almost instantly, Timothy recoiled, claiming that it had a sour and bitter taste. And pixie sticks are the opposite of that, unless, you know, someone's given them a sour one, like toxic waste filled pixie stick, but... That's not the case, as we'll find out. Within minutes, Timothy raced to the bathroom and was violently ill. He was throwing up, he was having fits and convulsions. Ronald's worst nightmare had become true. Someone had poisoned his son's candy. He instructed Elizabeth and the other children not to touch another piece and frantically called for an ambulance. Within an hour of arriving at the hospital, eight-year-old Timothy was dead. He had died from cyanide poisoning. It was determined that the amount of cyanide in his system was way above what would be considered the lethal dose for an adult, never mind an eight-year-old child. The scene was something straight out of a horror movie, but for the O'Brien family, they were living the nightmare. You always hear stories about, you know, poison sweets or razor baits being found inside sweets or if you're from the UK, needles inside sweets is, or like sweet bags is a very popular one. But it just feels like it would never happen to you. It's, a, it's always a story that you hear, but, you know, never happens. What kind of monster would deliberately poison children on the one night of the year where they're allowed to gorge on sweets until they're sick? In the case of Timothy O'Brien, the answer is much darker. The murder of Timothy O'Brien wasn't a sick prank by bored teenagers looking for a thrill, nor was it the work of a serial killer. Timothy's killer was much, much closer than that. Ronald O'Brien was a man in serious debt. He worked as an optician for the Texas State Optical Company, but that didn't relinquish the family of numerous loans and having to sell their house in order to keep themselves afloat. For a man who was in serious financial trouble, he had somehow managed to secure an increase on the insurance policies of his children, Timothy and Elizabeth. And I bet you can see where this story is going. Ronald confided in his friends about his money worries, telling them that he had to sell the house and other possessions just to keep the banks off their back. Although, here's the kicker, he did say that by the end of the year he was hoping to secure a small windfall that would solve all of their money worries. By October of 1974, the insurance policies on Timothy and Elizabeth totaled $60,000, or $30,000 each. Adjusted for inflation, that's around $158,000 in today's money for each child. If something terrible were to happen to either of them, then Ronald would be in line for a very handsome payout. With the tragic murder of little Timothy O'Brien, the police quickly launched an investigation and fear and panic spread throughout Deer Park, Texas. Parents threw away all of their children's sweets and the community lived in fear. The investigation showed that Ronald O'Brien had been responsible for the murder of his own son. 
Ronald had poisoned Timothy's pixie stick in order to gain $30,000 from his life insurance policy. In fact, Ronald had poisoned all of the other pixie sticks to make Timothy's death less suspicious and lead police to believe that they had some sort of madman on their hands. He gave one to his daughter Elizabeth along with four others to different children. Luckily, the police were able to intercept these before any further damage was done. Although police were able to intercept the poison sweets, one family came very close to being in the same position as the O'Briens. An 11-year-old boy in the neighbourhood had also been given one of the tainted pixie sticks by Ronald. His parents said that they found him asleep, cradling the pixie stick in his arms, as he just wasn't strong enough to get open the staples that Ronald had used to seal them shut. He didn't have enough strength to open it. It, it just sends shivers down your spine, the parents told newspapers. So where did Ronald get the cyanide? Through what is my favourite good old-fashioned detective work, police found out that Ronald had tried to get cyanide from his workplace, but failed to do so. He called a friend who worked at the Arco Chemical Company to see if they were able to get hold of any, but alas, they were not. Determined not to give up, and he wasn't going to let $30,000 slip through his hands that easy, Ronald went to the Curtin Matheson Scientific Company located in Houston, Texas. An employee there told Ronald that only large quantities for scientific applications could be bought. He then asked if he knew anyone who would be willing to sell him a smaller quantity. With all the evidence pointing towards him, police conducted a search of the O'Brien house. Inside, they found a pocket knife belonging to Ronald, and on the edge of the blade, they found traces of the plastic and the poison candy from the pixie sticks. Police finally had enough evidence to charge and arrest Ronald O'Brien, and the community of Deer Park were in complete shock. Realising just how close they had come, the community described Ronald as the man who killed Halloween. From that Halloween in 1974, parents held their children a little closer and thoroughly inspected all sweets, some even going as far as to ban trick or treating altogether. Ronald was known in the community and in the true crime community as the Candyman, and that's for good reason, you know, you might hear the stories of the Candyman or hear stories of poison sweets, and that is where this comes from. It comes from Ronald O'Brien. Now, as for uh, good old Ronnie, it only took the jury an hour to find him guilty of murder. Ronald would pay the ultimate price. The same price that Timothy had paid for his father's greed. With his life. Ronald O'Brien was put to death on March 31st, 1984, in the Ellis Unit at Huntsville Prison, Texas. Before his lethal ejection was administered, his last words were, quote, what is about to transpire in a few moments is wrong. However, we as human beings do make mistakes and errors. This execution is one of those wrongs, yet doesn't mean our whole justice system is wrong. Therefore, I would forgive all who have taken part in any way in my death. Also, to anyone I have offended in any way during my 39 years, I pray and ask for your forgiveness, just as I forgive anyone who offended me in any way. And I pray and ask God's forgiveness for us all respectively as human beings. To my loved ones, I extend my undying love. To those close to me, know in your hearts I love you one and all. God bless you and may God's blessing always be yours. Ronald C. O'Brien P.S. During my time here, I have been treated well by all TDC personnel. End quote. And when Ronald was being executed, there were people outside in Halloween costumes and Halloween masks cheering and obviously waiting for the news that he had passed. So he truly is one of the scariest monsters of Halloween. Not a slasher, not a ghost, but someone who poisoned his own child to gain $30,000.
that was this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed. I might have another episode coming out on the same day if I can find something that I like. But we'll see. We'll see. As always, you can find me on Patreon, Twitter, Facebook, anywhere. Just search True Crime Witch Podcast, I will appear. Don't forget to leave me a five-star review, or maybe a one-star review if you hate everything that I do, that's fine. (laughs) You can email me at truecrimewitch at outlook.com, or Twitter, you know, DM me or something, that's probably the best way to get through to me. And remember, friends, stay safe, but most importantly, stay spooky. (laughs) Ha ha ha!